Hello and welcome. This is Roger Connect, and this podcast is building the premier accounting firm. Here it is. We discuss the various things that you need to be doing to work on your business to ensure that you're, in fact, having the premier accounting firm in your area getting paid what you're worth. We'll range in topics from things related to marketing, selling, pricing, onboarding clients, doing things to improve client relations, offer quality accounting services, train your staff, even to include mental health. And today's going to be no exception with the topic. We have an excellent guest, someone that I've known for a number of years, someone that I'm eager to have back, having had him on the show before, and it's David Christel. He is the founder, CEO of Jetpack Workflow, an award-winning workflow software that helps accounting and bookkeeping firms track recurring client work so nothing falls through the cracks. Since launching Jetpack Workflow, the company has actually grown to serve over 6,000 professionals in 18 countries who've completed the 5M plus client projects on time. Now, in 2020, they reached the Inc. 5000 list as one of the country's fastest growing private companies. Definitely something to be proud of, and having done so, I can definitely attest to that. David is also the host of Growing Your Firm podcast, so appear in that regard with over 700,000 downloads, and co-authored the best-selling book, Double Your Accounting Firm. So, David, welcome to the show. Hey, Roger. Excited to be back. It's always fun to chat with you, and uh, you know, absolutely love the community you're building, so excited to, uh, to dig into some of the content today. Yeah, there's a variety of things that I'm excited to go over. The first of which is going to be, I think, somewhat apparent to the listeners. It's going to be workflow related. So we'll have that conversation. But there's a few other things that I've got in mind that we'll we'll cover as well. So first things first, um, obviously, Jetpack Workflow, that's where you're at and a lot of your passion. I want to back up a little bit, though, to give it some context. What drew you to want to focus on and feel that you actually had something to contribute to this issue that so many face, which is workflow management. Yeah, so th- this may be a slight, you know, atypical journey into how we entered the industry, but, uh, you know, we kind of looked at the accounting industry. Uh, and when I say accounting, I mean, it's encompassing accounting, bookkeeping, payroll, and tax, kind of the unsung heroes of uh, small to medium-sized businesses. They kind of are the glue that holds... Uh, so much of what you see together as you kind of move around or drive around a town or a city. And, you know, kind of with that premise, we said, okay, they're they're kind of the unsung heroes. We feel like, you know, a lot of times, frankly, uh, at least in the tech industry, uh, you know, certainly in, in, in 2015, 2016, uh, didn't seem to be getting a lot of attention, but felt like it was a really important uh, a part of, you know, how the whole world moves. And so ended up interviewing, literally interviewing, talking to hundreds of accounting firm owners and just trying to really understand what it's like to run a firm. Uh, what are the big bottlenecks? What are the pain points? What makes them want to, uh, uh, you know, throw their computer at the window? Uh, what piece of software they've been looking for they haven't been able to find? What's eating up a lot of their time? And really came across this problem of, uh, at the time, it was really talked about as checklist management. You know, I have all these clients with all these recurring uh, tasks and deadlines, and I need to see a way to uh, understand what what my team is doing, uh, what deadlines are coming up, collaborate with my team, make sure everything's on schedule, we're delivering a high quality product or service to our clients, and kind of everything in the market either pointed to generic task management, generic ta- uh, project management, which isn't really built for client-driven firms. Uh, They don't even have things called clients in a lot of these tools. And then we kind of looked at something that had been built in the industry and for a variety of reasons really didn't serve a lot of the the firms that we were talking to. Um, And then really just got obsessed with this kind of mentality around workflow and processes. And, you know, if you, you know, uh, uh, are able to zero in and get this right, the kind of freedom over your time that it then generates, the profitability uh, that increases in your firm, and just the overall satisfaction somebody could get out of running their business once they have, you know, a real a real playbook and a real set of templates in place that they know their team is following. Uh, so that's really how we how we came in was a bit from the outside in. Well, first of all, thank you for that explanation because I think you did very well kind of setting the stage for a number of the questions I want to ask. The compliment I want to also give is how you refer to accounting as being the backbone of the business world, you know, the the underlying foundation of the community. Uh, accounting is the language of business, and I think it is the unsung hero of, you know, keeping track of the money, keeping everything organized. It's, you know, how this is how loans are 
determined and calculated. There, there's so much that is needing the accounting. So I appreciate you you kind of recognizing that. But the workflow that you're addressing, the issue that you were seeing that they needed help with, there's a lot going on here. So I'm old enough, and this will tip my age, that I remember working not, not even with Post-it notes, going back to file trays where you'd be moving papers from one file tray to another file tray. And you're right, there is a process, especially years ago when you wanted to go paperless, to take that system and now automate it. But I want to go back before the automation. There's a lot to be said for workflows, having standard operating procedures, mm-hmm. the processes that you're describing. When you're running a firm and you're trying to ensure that your clients are receiving not only quality services, but the same service, regardless of whom it is in the office that's doing the work, you have to have systems in place. You have to have workflows. And when you're running the business, it's very important that you actually know where everyone is in these phases, especially if someone's missing work or on maternity leave or leaves the company, heaven forbid, that you can step in and pick up where they left off. What would you say is the value of having a workflow, a process in a business that you can delegate? Yeah, well, so before I dive in, my assumption here is that, you know, once you as the firm owner, leader, partner, once you've surpassed a level of revenue where you know the business isn't going under, I can pay my rent, or I can pay my mortgage, I, you know, financially, I may not be thriving, but I'm okay. I can cover the basics. Everyone's going to be okay. Food, housing, you know, if you have kids, kids are taken care of. Once you've reached that, so for some it's, you know, 100, 150, 200K in revenue, um, and you know things are kind of stable enough, creating standard operating procedures, and sometimes, you know, folks hear those words and they're like, oh my God, this sounds really Uh intense, really in depth. I don't have an MBA. I'm not going to draw a bunch of triangles and squares and circles on a whiteboard and then create a, you know, manufacturing process. I just mean having, having a checklist of how things need to get done and it will evolve and it will iterate and it'll be adjusted over time. But, you know, this is a, in my opinion, non-negotiable table stake mentality you need to have in order to scale your firm. If you want to get beyond 250 or 300 or whatever, I mean, depending on your, your, how good of a salesperson you may be, (laughs) you know, maybe it's a little bit higher, maybe it's a little bit lower, but you know, can you grind your way higher? Yeah, but you're going to burn out. Uh, and then start making really bad decisions about what to do with the firm. You might bring in a suboptimal partner. You might merge with a suboptimal firm. You might sell at a suboptimal time. You might uh, downscale aggressively to get it back to a period where you felt you had more control. Um, and all of these things you're trying to solve for the symptoms rather than the core issue, which is you never you know, defined that core set of, of procedures that you want your team to follow. Because at the end of the day, Software is great. Technology is great. We're in the people business. We need to make sure that whoever we hire, part-time, full-time contract or whatever it may be, that we have a sense of what they're doing, how they're doing it. And we really need to think of our, our firm and who we are in this firm as kind of manufacturing or production managers. We don't have to call ourselves that. We don't have to put that on the website. But the shift is going from uh, practitioner to production or manufacturing. It's, it's a critical mindset shift. And as a part of that, I feel, again, this is a non-negotiable uh, shift the business needs to make in order for you to scale successfully. Amen. Yeah, the idea of scaling the business, growing it, is contingent, I feel, on the quality and the consistency of the services that can be provided. And that's based upon the processes that you have in place. And I'm going to go so far as to say the value of the business is then determined based on how turnkey you have your company running. If you've got in place all the processes that that you know work autonomous from the owners and managers, that the work gets done, the quality is there, you've got a business and it has worth, it has value. I was in a previous discussion having a uh, conversation about the worth of an accounting firm. How do you establish that? And one of the bigger criteria was just the processes that were in place to ensure that the clients would be retained, that the quality of the work would be maintained. And uh, it all just falls back to this whole thing that we're discussing now. So this this is wonderful. Yeah, just to just to piggyback a little bit on that, because yeah. you talked about accounting is the, is the language of business. Completely agree. Another way to think about this is if you don't start this at kind of those revenue thresholds that I talked about, your business will be incurring debt. It's going to be incurring not financial debt, although maybe, but it will certainly be uh, 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 incurring organizational debt. 
And the more you hire without having this in place, the higher the interest rate becomes on that debt. So you're like, well, I hired one person. It's not a big deal. And they helped out a lot. I'm going to hire two people. Great. And, and you just get in this groove of that's how you solve problems. That's how you scale. You're like hiring people and you're looking over the shoulder and you're, you're, you know, always chatting with them on, on, uh, you know, zoom or teams or slack. Uh, but there's no scalability there. And at some point the interest rate becomes so high. You have four, five, six, eight people all running in a different kind of lane. It's all similar, but slightly different, which means every time there's a problem or defect or issue, you kind of have to triage them as unique instances rather than a universal system. And that interest rate becomes so taxing on your organization that it burns the owner out. Oh, I, I, I love how you're describing this. I've not heard it described as this interest rate. And I'm liking that analogy because you are so right. When you're first starting out and you're hiring someone, they've got skills, experience. You're like, okay, they know what they're doing. I'll let them go do it. And what you're doing is rather than managing the process, you're dealing with fires and mistakes and dealing with issues. The more you can get on top of the process, the more ensure you're able to ensure quality and consistency. But here's the point that I think you're making so well is – with the the investment at the right phases, you're not having to go through all of that retooling, reworking, retraining as you backwards the entire office to say, and here's how we're going to do it next. You're setting it up at the beginning. You're putting in quality procedures, workflow that actually is efficient. When I work with my clients, one of the things that I do is what we refer to as mapping the business. We, in mapping the business, identify where the biggest challenge or opportunity in the company lies, and the P represents production. The P is contingent upon efficiency and profitability. And just like you said, if you're not being efficient, the more and more you grow, the less and less efficient you are, therefore the less and less the profits are, you're, you're saying it exactly as it should be said. So this is, this is wonderful. So here's my, my question to you about productivity. What do you think holds someone back from investing in the process, taking the time to whiteboard out this this workflow, to invest in the systems to ensure that they actually are all following a process? What holds a person back from implementing this? So I'll give you two answers. One's a, a I will call it a woo-woo answer, and one's a very kind of like practical answer. So I'll go start with the practical one, and, okay. and uh, we'll see which, which lane you want to drive down. <laughs> um, so a very practical answer is if you fall into the groove of I hire to solve problems, then it always, and, and, and because of that, you know, you, you can kind of look at these things as, as like kind of cascading, cascading uh, output. So, um, you know, you, your firm hits a tipping point where referrals, word of mouth, creates an influx of clients. Uh, you want to keep up with demand, so you quickly try to fill the gap. You hire somebody. That works okay. The firm is stabilized enough where you can fulfill the client work. Um, through feats of heroic effort, uh, You know, quality maintains. And because that quality maintains, your word of mouth and referrals continue to, to, to go on. And you hire a second person, you hire a third person. And then again, like I talked about earlier, you are then triaging what feels like sometimes a lot of unique requests, but that's because there's nothing standardized in the business, or at least not enough, or there's a lack of clarity or communication of where it's standardized. And so you run into the situation which you're like, I know I need to do this, but I don't have the time to do it. And I don't have the time to do it because I never, I didn't do it two or three years ago and I needed to. And so, you know, sometimes it's just, uh, well, twofold on the practical front. One, uh, the hard reality of you might have to pause uh, demand. So you cannot take on any more clients until you figure this out. And then the other thing on a practical perspective is do not overcomplicate this. You know, uh, ho hopefully you're at a stage where, you know, still from a headcount perspective, it's rather manageable to get everybody into a room, uh, walk through the updated standardized process and communicate where that process is going to live. Obviously, I want that process to live in Jetpack workflow, but if it lives in a spreadsheet, so be it. Just get it to a place where, uh, you know, this is how we complete our, our 1120s or 1040s or month-end close, this is what it looks like. Uh, these are the tasks. Uh, this is the information, the context everybody needs to complete those tasks. And this is what you do when you have a question or you're in trouble. Uh, and so just making sure everybody's kind of in the room, they can ask questions about the process. Uh, you'll probably you know hear things like one person say, oh, that's interesting. You listed these four things. I always do this fifth step or step number three is a little bit different for me. This is the time to kind of iron out any differences, and this is the really great work. Uh, but you know, it, you're going to have to slow down to speed up, 
and don't yeah. overcomplicate it. If you can get one or two, you know, do one service, start there, the one that's causing the most pain. So I, I would kind of look at that. That's the practical lane. The woo-woo lane is just some level of, of frankly, uh, self-esteem and self-confidence on scaling and building up a business. Uh, I've also seen this, and it's hard to obviously quantify how it shows up, but there's a conceptual understanding that it, it, we know this needs to be done, but there's this kind of insecurity or hesitation of kind of going out of your comfort zone. And your comfort zone is like, I know how to do the accounting work. I'm going to continue to do it. And there's there's something to just breaking out and shifting a little bit of how you identify yourself and who you are. You're moving from, I'm an accountant to, I'm a business owner. Uh, yes. or I'm an entrepreneur. And I think yes. that's a big shift too. Oh, th this is wonderful. Um, so I'm going to kind of throw a few things in here because I think you're, you're going to have some comments on them. One, I uh, recently had an experience, and I say recently, it was about a year and a half ago, when we were doing a cross-train of employees within the company. And I'm going to bring that up for a reason, and uh, I'll come right back to it. The second thing is working with a client, we were uh, setting up processes, and one of them was the onboarding of accounting clients. And so let me go to the cross train and then I'm going to come back to this onboarding process of accounting clients. In the cross train, one of the things that was quite fascinating is as we were identifying the steps to do a particular task, a project, there were a lot of things that were intuitive, meaning the, the person that did the job just thought it was obvious and they wrote out a statement of this is what needs to be done. What we quickly realized is in order for someone else to do it, it necessitated them having login rights, permissions, uh, passwords. They needed to have their own profile. So it, it wasn't enough to just simply write out the task of what needed to be done. There were a lot of things that someone else needed in order to perform that task. And it was a tool, their, their ability to log into access a certain platform. And the same was true in the accounting world. When, when dealing with an accounting firm that was hiring or bringing on new clients, they had this process of, you know, we need access to their bank account. Well, to get that from the client was more than just a single line of a task. It was, okay, we're going to be getting these certain rights. We need to be able to record access to these things in this platform so that if someone was get, going to get in, this is where we go to find this person's access. It was incredible. And my point is, you're right. It can be daunting, but I think sometimes we oversimplify and yet, if we just do like you're describing, take a little bit of time and effort and do it right, it actually does simplify the process. Am I making sense? Is this helping? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just goes back to, you know, in my mind, slowing down to speed up a little bit. Yeah, because yeah. you're, I mean, what happens is you start running down this this path. Well, we need to build process. And your examples are wonderful, right? So you're building it out. And you're like, great. We've standardized the process. Okay, let's put it, you know, again, if it's not a jetpack, let's just call it a spreadsheet of some sort. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, who needs access to that spreadsheet? I don't know. Do Like, okay, well, that, you know, just by that nature, let's say it's a Google sheet, uh, you know, it's like, well, you know, uh, we want everybody to have an organizational email in order to access it. We don't want outside parties to access it. Oh, but not everybody has an organizational email. Yep. Oh, do we want to set everybody up on that email? Yeah, it's five, seven dollars a month. Like that's another price. And you know, then we gotta remember to use that email. And it's like, I'm not sure. And so there are, you know, things that can come up. Don't don't, you know, lose the, the forest for the trees. Uh, but you you know, try to knock these down, but don't lose sight of, you know, the goal is for you to never have whatever, you know, typically these things spawn up when there's a problem in the business, like owner keeps getting the same question or they don't feel like they can unplug in the evenings or weekends because things are always on fire. It's like, don't lose sight of that's the problem we're trying to solve. And, you know, sometimes you can find a really elegant solution as you're going through this process. And other times you say, you know what, right now we have an organizational debt and it has a very high interest rate. And if we go from an interest rate of 35%, but we implement the solution and gets us to 15%, my gosh, that's great. And you know what? We could pick our heads up next quarter. We could try to get this down to 10% or 5% or a more reasonable interest rate. Because the organization the organization that's growing, you're always going to have a little bit of debt. There's always going to be things that are going on. And so sometimes you can find that perfect thing that takes you from a 35% to a 5 And you're like, wow, that's amazing. Count your blessings. You found one of those. But don't lose sight of even, even a, you know, call it more incremental gain. 
still has compounding benefits, especially with process and workflow, because every single person in the firm at scale is going to benefit from having these. So I, these things are going to come up, but don't let them uh, block you or drain you or go down too many rabbit holes. You know, Keep focused on the outcome you're trying to get to. And the other thing is, set a deadline for yourself. Like, Roger, your examples are so great because there's all these little things that could come up and somebody could say, you know, you know, staff member likes the blue color and the other one likes the red color, the other one likes the purple color. And you can just get bogged down all these things that could show up. You want to address as many impactful ones as you can, but set a deadline to say, I'm going to have this solved, at least a version one solution by this date. You know, make it enough time without you know, burning you out, but don't make it forever. Say, hey, look, we're in two weeks or four weeks, we're going to have version one and we're going to revisit this every quarter and we can update it and evolve. But if you don't get started with a, with a version one, it, you're just constantly going to find ways to go into other, call it more enticing parts of the business, getting clients, looking at other, you know, whatever it may be. So when I'm working with firms, the owner of a firm, and I'm talking to them about let's say internal processes as we're discussing today. One of the things that I find stands in the way of their moving forward is in addition to the daunting, all the triangle squares, all the workflows is their ego. And I bring up ego simply because of the fact that I've, I've been surprised time and again, how often their job satisfaction comes from how much they're needed in the company. In the fact that they're there, like you, you use the term 35, percent interest down to 5% interest. I, I'm going to refer to those as fires. When they go to the office and their their day consists of answering this question, resolving this thing, and they feel as if the company is running because of their ability to deal with or answer questions because they're the wealth of the knowledge in the business. I want to push back on that. And I work with the business owner to realize that the value of their business is a reflection of how self-sustaining the company can be in the absence of the owner. And if that key individual can be retracted, go on vacation, uh, leave, go to a conference, uh, go out on a marketing call and grow the business. But the point is, is that ego needs to get out of the way so that the business owner isn't the thing that is needed to run the business. And so once that business owner, as a client of mine, realizes, you know what, it'd be fun to get to the point where people could do their jobs without having to ask me not only for permission, but the how-tos. And that's where you start to get into, like you were describing, a Google sheet that has the workflows where the passwords are protected or the 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 process of this or that. All of a sudden, they start thinking out how, and it leads them to something like you have, which is Jetpack. So all of a sudden, they start to realize, I'm going to build a business here that somebody could literally see worth in because they could purchase it from me, not my clients, they can purchase it from me, not my employees, the process, because anyone can do what we've got because we've simplified it to the point where it's down to the least common denominator. And it really comes to two things that I emphasize. It's you have to take what you have and make it better. What are you doing in your organization to improve the internal processes? And the second thing is to look at what things you can be doing to become more efficient, to deliver the same quality of service in a more efficient, quicker, seamless way. What would you add to that? First off, really well said. When you said ego, I'm like, I'm curious where you're going with this, but I, you know, it definitely resonated with what we've heard and 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 we've seen. Uh, my reaction to that is, I think one of the most challenging parts of being a firm owner, really just business owner large, is retreating to your comfort zone. You know, it there there's a lot of unknowns when you start and you try to drive yourself to stability through client acquisition, through hiring a team, and then you reach stability and you reach a level of comfort and you reach a level of uh, satisfaction, like you said, in, in solving issues. You feel like you're showing up and you're being very uh, uh, effective, although we can argue that you're not, but you, you have that feeling that you're being effective and you know what that job is and you know how that job gets done, right? People come to you with issues, you solve issues, you move on, you meet with some clients, you review KPIs, you know what that job is. I'm assuming if you're listening to this podcast and you're in communities like these and you're in that arena, there is then a growing disconnect between where you're at today and where you feel like you want to take the firm. So you're at 2 million, you want to get to 5 million. You're at half a million, you want to get to a million. There is some future version of your firm 
that you want to get to. And I think one of the hardest things to uh, digest emotionally is the things you're comfortable and probably pretty darn good at doing right now will have to be delegated and 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 set up in such yep. a way so you can move on to the next challenge. And unfortunately, that next challenge, uh, you may not be as effective day one as you are at whatever you're doing today. And so you will have hurdles, you will have mistakes, you will have bumps in the road. And so let's say you are the emergency person, you put in the workflow tool, uh, you train the team on it, everybody knows how to use it. Great. Now what do you do with yourself? Well, you might want to start building out your executive team. You might want to start building out managers to then manage the pods of, of or working groups that you have in the organization. You've never built out that team. You're unsure how to manage that team, how to recruit them, how to hire them, how to compensate them, how to pull them into maybe strategy if you want to have that conversation with them. This is a whole new arena of unknowns. It's really intimidating. You're probably not going to be great at it day one. And you might have even stepped your toes in that. Maybe you tried to hire a manager, it didn't work out. And so you kind of retreat it to what you're familiar with. But, you know, you have to be aware that mistakes will happen. You're not going to be perfect. Uh, you need to learn aggressively and, and, and be very reflective on how you're evolving the organization. Nobody's going to get it right the first time. But it is such a common trap. And I think literally every entrepreneur and business owner I've ever talked to has absolutely made the mistake of, you know, I'm trying to grow it but I keep retreating to places I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. This happens everywhere. Yeah, the comfort zone. So I'm going to share something here that I, I, th I think you can even add further to. So I was in a meeting once where it was a training really with a um, the president of a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar company. And in the training, he said something that really resonated. He said, my job is literally to put to, it is to fire myself every six to 12 months, which is to say, I need to figure out a new role, a new job, hire someone to do that task, and I move on, meaning I don't do that anymore. And I was like, wow, that's fascinating. And then I look back on my career and the client relations that I have, and it really started to make sense. So here's my illustration of it. In an accounting firm, imagine somebody starting out. They take on accounting clients. They're the accountant. They're doing the work. And they finally realize, okay, I've read, let's say, e-myth workflow. I need to document Del duplicate, delegate. So I'm going to document what I do for my clients and I'm going to hire another bookkeeper, another accountant to work with me. Hey, that process went well. They're doing good with clients. I'm going to grow some more clients rather than turning them away. I'm going to hire another bookkeeper, accountant, tax person. So the point is, is all of a sudden I'm starting to have colleagues in my office that are doing this. And I start to realize no longer is my time best spent doing the work for the clients. I've got a process in place. I'm going to hire someone else to now do it. I'm going to manage the five people I've got that are working with clients. And I'm going to have a different role with the clients that I work with. Well, I've taken myself by default out of doing the accounting. I'm no longer dealing with the transactions, running the reports, preparing the reports. Uh, all of a sudden now, my my I've fired myself from that role and I've taken on this management role. Well, now I'm in management and I start to realize, you know, I have vision as the business owner here. I don't want to be managing solely these five accounting professionals, bookkeepers and so forth. I want to actually start offering tax services, let's say. And so I'm going to now start doing taxes. I'm going to hire somebody that's a tax expert. I'm going to hire a third, a fourth, a fifth. Now I've got a tax department that does tax services. Now I've got an accounting department that's doing the bookkeeping and accounting. You know what? I'd like to get in more into advisory roles. And so I'm going to now start doing advisory for some of my clients. Well, I'm no longer doing the accounting and bookkeeping. I'm no longer doing the, the tax preparation and planning, but I am doing the CFO and advisory with my clients. You know what? I like this. This is fun. I'm going to hire someone else that has this type of insights to business management and so forth, and I'm going to have them also with me do CFO and advisory services. So now they're taking on the, that role. And now I'm no longer wanting to work with the clients. I'd like a little bit more free time. I'm at a stage in my life where I'd be interested in doing basically things when I want to, how I want to. So I'm going to hire another individual to do the CFO and advisory services, and I'm out of that role. And now I'm running a very successful firm. I'm now in the multi-millions of, of revenue in the sense that I've got many accounting clients, many a tax uh, preparation and planning client, many a CFO and advisory clients. I'm making let's say 500,000, a million dollars a year, I'm doing very well. Well, the beauty of it is, is this has all been built upon the fact that you have workflows, processes that are duplicatable that you're able to delegate. And this all stems from what we're talking about, which is the workflow. Uh, is that a good illustration at a very high level of what we're talking about today? Yeah, I love it. Uh, the only the only wrinkle I would add is, is probably a 
a, a layer of sometimes we'll interact with firm owners and they're very entrepreneurial. So they love launching services and, you know, they'll put, they'll put, they'll put heads of those services in place. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then all of a sudden there's a need to uh, create organizational clarity or workflow or communication lanes across all services. So then you can go back to sales and marketing and say, well, now we offer four, five, six services. How do we communicate to this marketplace without being completely confusing? Right. And so you need to kind of assess you know, between, between kind of interest and what the firm needs, you know, what is, what is the bottleneck, right? And so uh, just because we've seen this a lot with entrepreneurial accountants, it's like, well, we offer these six things or these seven things, whatever it may be, but it's really confusing for the marketplace. So you can figure that out, fix that. And it's like, okay, now we have our value prop is in place. We have these services in place. We really love this. Oh my gosh, you know, we're, uh, growth is, 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 our client growth is, is, is up, up and to the right. Uh, but now we need to like rapidly scale our talent. So guess what? You have a new system. <laughs> you have a new thing to figure out. And uh, and last but not least, I love your example is, you know, you reach a place where, you know, maybe financially you're like, well, I reached it. I feel really good. Firm's running really well. And then maybe the last and final process is your succession plan is, you know, how do you hire a new CEO? Yeah. How do you hire a new person, a new GM to to run the business? And you go off and uh, you you travel and and you read and you write and do all this you know whatever you want to do and you and you check in on board meetings or whatever structure you have set up uh to keep a pulse uh, on your business um so yeah i I completely agree that these the the systems are compounding and the process of exploration and then once you've hit gold creating systems to then get yourself out of that i think is spot on yeah well i appreciate your contribution to the to the, my my quick illustration of a firm and its growth and the evolution of it, um, your point about services though I do want to address that. I agree. Too often I work with firms and I find that it's very very unclear what the client is paying for. The client is not clear what they're what they're buying, and I think your point is to the the firm in going into the marketplace what it's trying to offer is so critical at this point. So I'm going to try and simplify it. I really feel that there are three core services that a firm can consider offering. And if in your business model, you want to offer one service, let's say in year one, year three, you're going to offer two services. In year five, you're going to offer three services. That's a great growth projection. It's something to be building the firm on. But what are those services? It's accounting and bookkeeping, tax planning and preparation, CFO and advisory services. But within each, there's two. Bookkeeping is a far different service than accounting services. And the bookkeeping services are very lucrative, very profitable, very, very much in demand. But bookkeeping isn't accounting and accounting isn't bookkeeping. And and I'll, I can go into those in much more detail elsewhere. But the point is, is when you're selling the bookkeeping services to your client, what are the expectations that the client has? You've got to be clear on both the features and the benefits of what it is they're purchasing. Same goes for the accounting. The tax planning, the tax preparation, tax preparation services is entirely different than tax planning services. When you're getting into cost segregation, R&D tax credits, when you're getting into conservation easements, different tax strategies from a planning point of view, that's totally different than filing the tax return for the clients and meeting the tax deadlines. The CFO and advisory service is very distinct. And so when you're able to define for your client specifically what it is you're doing, what they're paying for and getting, I think the the expectations of the client are managed. You're able to over deliver and make happy customers. That's all very important. So as a firm, you can decide we do tax uh, preparation and we do bookkeeping. We don't do accounting. We don't do tax planning. We don't do CFO. In two years, you may say, you know what, the bookkeeping clients, let's start offering accounting services to them and we'll continue to do tax preparation. But we don't do tax planning. We don't do um, uh, CFO and advisory services. Well, five years out, you're doing bookkeeping, accounting, tax preparation. And you may say, do we consider offer tax planning services? Maybe we move into the CFO or the advisory space. You know what, we're just going to hold here. We're going to continue to do bookkeeping. We're going to continue to do accounting. And we're going to continue to do tax preparation. Those are our core services. That's what we're going to offer for tax planning, for CFO and advisory. They're going to go elsewhere. That clarity really does help refine the marketing message that you're taking to the marketplace, what the client can expect for the fees that they're paying, and then you're able to over-deliver based on the clarity of what your message has been as to the services that you're providing. So uh, very, very important there. Um, 
David, I want to ask about recession proofing. Um, I know for a lot of people, the buzzword is, is that we are in a recession. We're going to be in a recession. Uh, how do workflows actually tie into this? What what in, insights do you have as regards to recessions? Yeah, a couple things. Um, well, let me let me let me put a point on what you just mentioned about the service mix. I think you, the oh, questions yeah, yeah. you're asking, you know, in that example, are critical. But you only get to ask those questions if you have time to think about really great answers. And the only, the only way you get time <laughs> is with workflow and processes. So do not, you know, run downfield and, you know, you, you get to entertain all these things until you feel like you have the space and the wherewithal to really take those things on. They're new. They're exciting. You love thinking about service mixes. Make sure you have the capacity both for you to think about this, but then for you to also execute. Um, on the on the recession end, well, first off, good news you know, uh, uh, you know, at least in our in our community, I think it's similar with yours. You know, by the nature of the work that everybody does, it is relatively recession proof. Uh, even when the entire economy shut down, we didn't even know if there's going to be money distributed to SMBs. Uh, accountants were still uh, required to to you know manage the books, look at the finances, and of course, as PPP and loans came available, you know, even more critical, even more poor, even more overloaded with work. So I think just by the nature of the work that we do, th- there is a level of stability and recession proof to the industry at large. Now, for a specific firm, I think we go back to the fundamentals. You know, anytime you know you find yourself in a situation uh, like a recession. And you feel like there could be danger on the horizon. I always like to go back and just think about the fundamentals and make sure that we're executing really, really well on those and potentially making hard decisions if we need to on the fundamentals. So what are some examples? You know, are we serving the right customer? Who is our best client? Okay, we have all these different clients. Who's the best client? We want who's the who's the type of client we need to make sure we do not lose or we lose to a minimal extent during the recession. They're 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 flower shop owners. Uh, their business is doing north of five million in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They are you know whatever it may be, dental practices in the Northeast. Doesn't matter. Make sure you have crystal clarity on who what types of clients would we not want to lose? Do they understand the value we are delivering to them and have we priced them effectively? And so I would wrap my arms around, you know, ideal client, are we pricing and are we delivering value? And I would think about um, you know, those things. And and frankly, I don't know if this would this will hurt you to hear this, Roger, but I would put pricing last. I'd say let's make sure we put Put our ideal clients on the table. Okay, they are they are dental practices north of a million in Northeast America. Cool. What is the value we're delivering to them? I don't know. We do a hodgepodge of kind of like, you know, things for them. We do payroll for some, bookkeeping for others. It's kind of all over the place, a little scattered. We kind of feel like it's, you know, maybe we don't say this out loud, but we feel like sometimes it's a little bit generic what we do. Okay. And then pricing, and then we price like everybody else. Okay, well, let's think about that value equation. And how can we think about ways to stand out for that? special client that we want to serve and maybe it's positioning it better maybe it's just one or two little tweaks that can really make a big impact and then we'll get to pricing because the first thing is let's make sure we don't lose those clients let's make sure that they're receiving you know and are happy with the value of the firm and if we feel good about those two then you could probably think about how you could package and price more effectively for some that might be paying a little bit more some might be a little bit less uh, if you pick typically the right ideal client uh, I'm trying to think. I'm sure there's examples I have where this didn't work out, but I can't think of any. But anytime you 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 you, you think about your packaging, it's very value driven. It's typically niched somehow for that industry. And you're pretty clear about who your ideal client is. You know, you could typically price it a little bit more, sometimes a lot more, when you have that. And it doesn't matter if it's a recession, non recession. Uh, folks are going to be able to thrive in any environment. And those are the ones you typically want as clients. So I'd go back to the fundamentals, make sure what we're doing you know, is the right thing for the right client at the right time. And I would just start there before getting really fancy with anything else. You know, I appreciate the fact that you talked about the ideal client. I do know that in the recent years, you can go back to 2008 through 2010 or so, you can go back and literally do some research and find out which niches, which industries actually thrive during the downturn versus those that struggled and expect that that's, that may happen again, that those same industries that did well will thrive. Those that struggled may again struggle. The thing I would couple with what you just described is I think this is really a, an opportunity for the accounting firms 
to do a great service to the business community because business owners, when cash flow is great, they're not so sensitive to the goings on of the accounting, perhaps. They're not, not as sensitive. But all of a sudden, when the cash flow becomes tight and they as a business need to start looking at how do we start cutting costs, to turn to the accounting professional and help have them help identify what things may be unnecessary expenses because they can't show a, a clear ROI or at least go in and figure out what things are the highest profit margined items in the business that they should be doubling down in their marketing to sell more of because there's more margin in those things for them to, to profit from. These are the intricacies that the accounting professional can bring to the business model that the owner needs help addressing to make very important decisions for the livelihood of the business to exist. So when business is good, you know, can the business owner necessarily say which product line is the highest profit margin? Maybe. Today, with the recession, should they? They have to be. And the accountant is the one that's going to be able to bring that information to the table and help that business owner make more informed, educated business decisions. So I feel that they're they're critical to the success of the businesses during the recession. This is where the accounting firms can really make a difference in their clients making it through it, being profitable, being successful, and not being negatively impacted or as bad. Would you add to that at all? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think the one the one wrinkle here for somebody listening is like you might, you know, have an ideal client that is disproportionately negatively impacted by a recession. And I think that doesn't mean you can kind of throw them by the wayside, but you should think very strategically, uh, you know, so some will some will unfortunately have to close. Some of the larger ones will have to downsize. Uh, can you position yourself to obviously be uh, the best for those that are in the best position to survive. Now, having said that, if you have large exposure to a sec sector that's going to be impacted by the recession, your firm will be impacted from a revenue and profitability perspective. And so, you know, you can, you know, and again, this is why thinking time and having time to, to kind of reflect on business is so important is because then you can think about and have a decision to say, okay, you know, we're currently serving 100 clients in this sector. The recession, you know, what we've seen is disproportionately impacts them. Let's say that gets cut in half. What's that do to our revenue? Can we withstand that? Um, yes, no, maybe. Uh, but then the follow-up questions are, so, okay, so what's the plan of attack? Do we then uh, offer, add, resell additional services to the 50 that remain and try to scoop up more wallet share, uh, help them round out? Maybe we don't do payroll. Maybe we do payroll now, and we can loop that in and bundle that into our services. Uh, maybe we can refer them out to adjacent services in IT and HR and try to give them a discount for that that referral. Uh, or do we think that we have a shot at, uh, you know, while this one's going down potentially by 50%, this one can go up by XX percent and can help offset any losses we might have. And so uh, you, you just need to take a, take a step back, and now's a really good time to think very strategically about your client mix and whether if you do have large exposure, you want to expand wallet share and how would you do that and what would you need to implement to do that? Or do you want to have kind of two, two, you know, a, a secondary uh, a client that you can work with that seemingly has less uh, risk in the event of, of a recession? But this all stems from you having the time to think through these questions. Yeah, no, this is great. I, I don't want to do a... a, a um, a negative on this show to end on this, but I'm going to throw this in real quickly here as, as we're nearing where we're going to wrap it up. But I do know that there are times when I've been working with clients where the business owner is seriously having to decide when to shut down the business. When is it right to stop all the bleeding? And there is a formula for that. There's actually a way to determine, you know, if I'm losing $5,000 a month today and tomorrow I'm going to, you know, next month I'm going to lose 5000 and the next month after that 5000 yeah, it's a loss, but if I stay in business, I might be able to turn this around if I put you know a little bit of effort into X, Y, and Z. If I shut down the business, the contractual obligations that I have to, let's say, the, the rent or lease or the property that I have or other contracts that I'm obliged to, all those fixed costs, by shutting down the business, they don't disappear. So I might have fixed costs of $20,000, $200,000. Well, if I'm losing five thousand, it's far better to lose five thousand than to be obliged on the hook for the two hundred thousand that I'm that I have as fixed costs. So, you you have to weigh and determine. Okay, am I at that that tipping point? So, 
I, I think your point is exactly right. Um, there's a lot to be assessed and the accountant can come in and really help with these conversations. And having been a part of some of these conversations as businesses, you know, you, sometimes you just don't have a good product or sometimes you just don't have a good, a good uh, leader running a business. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why companies can fail, but to make the decision at the right time for the right reason is, is uh, hopefully a non-emotional thing that as an accounting professional, we can come from and maybe bring to the table just the, the money sense of it all. So um, let's see here. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask real quickly is just regarding the future of accounting. Um, I just wanted to ask if you had any insights or thoughts as to where things may be going in the accounting space as you see it from your perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, kind of a mixed bag for me here, but I mean, in COVID, we thought everything was going to change and it's kind of fallen. Some, some things have changed, some things have not changed. Um, you know, I think the trends that are going to be enduring and just, you know, uh, very, very impactful. And eventually it's just going to be table stakes. So you're going to have to switch, but you're not going to get any of the advantage, uh, incremental revenue gain or profit gain by doing so. But you're going to have to just to stay in business, you know, is bundling uh, subscription services together, uh, thinking about uh, packaging. Uh, maybe you still do one off hourly, but you, you need to think about packaging at a fixed rate, uh, certainly for kind of the common recurring elements. Um you know, I, I don't think that's going anywhere. I think the sub subscription economy is going to continue to compound. I think the uh, hybrid work environment is obviously here to stay. And so when I think hybrid, it means you are digital by default. So things have to live in a place where people can kind of work in and outside of their office. Again, we want it to be secure. So we'll just say in the office and at home. Um, but I don't think that's going anywhere. And I think the the, you know, overall technology trends, you know, uh, are going to be fascinating. So um, while it's taken just a massive nosedive, I think, you know, uh, blockchain technologies are still kind of interesting for, you know, if nothing else, contract management and how the state of contracts are going to be altered and changed. We, we seemingly haven't haven't found a, a, a right mechanism or, or use case to really ignite uh, blockchain technology. So I don't think we need to short term be worried about it. But I think there's some interesting implications that could go on for accounting. And then for folks that, you know, kind of live in the world of tech, um, it was probably hard to ignore uh, the release of chat GBT. Oh, yeah. uh, and so the, the, yeah, the fun thing about chat GBT is it's, it's kind of democratized access to, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a model where folks can kind of interact with a, I would say, you know, a basic, but still very impressive uh, AI system. And yeah. so just to give you a glimpse of what you can do, and you can go to OpenAI and you can kind of download ChatGBT. And you, I mean, for me, I just bookmarked it on my phone and you can kind of interact with it. But you can do interesting things like, uh, hey, ChatGBT, write me a sales email uh, selling accounting services to HVAC firms. And I'll write that email. And you say, you know what, can you make it shorter? And then it'll make it shorter. And you say, you know what, can you make it funnier? And they'll make it funnier. And I'll say, you know what, can you take this and turn it into a tweet or whatever? And it'll do that. And so... You know, it, I think it's fascinating. Uh, there, you know, the the potential augmentation of of interactions with clients and the nature of our work. I think is, you know, it's still very early in in the world of what's going to happen with these new pieces of technology. But I think that's a really fun one. And unlike blockchain technologies, uh, Chat GBT is something you can kind of open up and you can ask them for recipes, or you can ask them for basic stats, or you can ask them for answers, and you can interact with it. And so I think there's there's, it's kind of easier to, to kind of grok use cases uh, of what to do. And then last but not least, the, from a future perspective, I think we're going to continue to see the increase of the fractional workforce, maybe not entirely for an accounting firm. So, uh, But I think it's going to continue to increase. I think there's going to be more fr freelancers, consultants, and contractors that kind of come in. Maybe it's 10, 20 hours a week, or maybe they come in for a defined period and then you know head out and kind of go on to their next project. I think that's going to continue to trend. Uh, we've obviously seen that with all the marketplaces popping up. Uh, we've seen that with on and offshore. And I think COVID's kind of been an accelerator, you know, with a hybrid work environment and then opens up your employment, you know, opportunities, which by extension opens up fractional workforce opportunities. So I think that's going to continue as well. So Roger, those are my, those are my kind of handful of high level thoughts. You nailed it. I, <laughs> when you were describing the, uh, the chat ability and how that as an AI can write an article, I'm, I'm already dealing with it. I'm already working with it. I love it. It's, it's mind blowing at this point. I'm in awe of it. And I really do feel that it's revolutionary. So I'm excited to see this year 
how we're going to be able to use it professionally. I'm using it in my company now and we're finding applications for it. And I love, I'm, I'm continually amazed by what it's able to do. So quite fascinated by it. Um, yes. uh, two other questions real quick to end on. What is something you're looking forward to doing, accomplishing professionally this year and personally this year? Oh, so professionally we have, without going too much in the details, the largest product update in the history of the company. It, wow. It's going to be uh, uh, unique. It's going to be sizable. It's going to be interesting. I won't go into the details, but yeah. in our six, seven years of operating, this 2023 will be the biggest update and launch. So stay tuned for around the summer. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll see you'll see press clippings. It's certainly press worthy. Uh, so more information to come uh, on that. And then, you know, Personally, it's it's you know, for lack of a better word, I, I'll just call it traveling again. You know, I have, a, I have a young family, so COVID was kind of hard, and we look forward yeah. to kind of uh, continuing to get out in the world and uh, uh, you know exploring again. So we did that a little bit last year, and we want to continue this year. Beautiful, yeah. You do have a young family. Um, this is great. I, I think life's great. I love the conversation we've just had. I really felt that we nailed some very important topics and i appreciate your insights on all of those so here's what i'm going to do i'm going to just kind of wrap things up i'm going to do kind of a summary of our conversation and then come to you for a final thought uh the first thing that i'd like to do is just as a quick offer for the episode uh just as listeners go to the episode description and you'll find there two great things that david is providing first of all is a two-week free trial a link to jetpack that you can take advantage of as well as he has a book that is called the 32 templates that you'll want to take advantage of so go there get a, uh, get access to those two things the two-week free trial access to Jetpack if you're not yet familiar with it, as well as the 32 templates. In addition to that, what I'll be putting is a link to an ebook called In the Black. It's the nine principles to making your business profitable. And it's in that book that we talk about mapping the business, which I, is something I mentioned earlier, as well as this concept of taking your internal processes and making them better. And it addresses those things and helps you see how you can work on your business and literally do the things that make it profitable. Now, from an overview or a summary of our conversation. I just like discussing workflow. I've seen time and time again working with the clients where we've gone in and really try to systematize some of the things that are going on in the business, taking things that people think are just innate and uh, uh, simple and really trying to make them duplicatable so that other people can get involved. It is amazing how it's a game changer for the business. It really does free up a lot of people. It allows them to take time off. It allows them to delegate. It allows them to grow the business. And I do appreciate David's insights as to really what holds a business owner maybe back from that, the intimidation, how it can be daunting to think of, I've got to do this whole task and his advice to simply say, start simple, do it, do it just at the most basic level and just start implementing just some, some uh, workflows that can be uh, delegated out or expected of those people in the office. And you'll start to find how valuable they are in the organization. I really liked the recession proof discussion that we had where we talked about services. Uh, David, I think was very clear to show that accounting is such a basically the foundation the backbone of the economy as he began with but when it comes to recession proofing to really figure out which is your ideal client and what is it you can really make a difference for them as they're maybe dealing with some of the struggles related to the economy and as an accounting profession literally step in and be the difference as to helping them find where those uh, profit margins are what things are the unnecessary expenses that they maybe need to be uh, maybe need to do without so lots of little nuggets in here that we were discussing uh David's perspective on the future, so many things that uh, I think are on the horizon are still fascinating. And uh, just as I was mentioning, the open AI, uh, that's a game changer. I think as, as I get more and more introduced to it and exposed to it, I'm seeing so many potential applications in the business world uh, on a personal level, but definitely in the business level. And I'm excited for us to be able to, at least in my company, put those into effect. So lots of great little gems there. And now that you brought up that Jetpack's can going to be doing a large update i'm eager to see what it's going to turn out to be so thank you for sharing that david it's been great having you on the show what's your final thought yeah it's a great summary i would just say go out and make it happen right i think everybody listening to this you have the tools you know what it needs uh, uh you know what it takes to, to get done and just go out and make it happen and anyway roger or i could support you reach out to us but go out and make it happen 
Beautiful. Well, with that being said, everyone, thank you for listening in. Obviously, with this and every other episode, we encourage you to subscribe. And in doing so, make sure that you put out those alerts, notifications, so that you get notified when we release the new episodes each and every week. And I also encourage you, as you subscribe, to go back and listen to the previous episodes, the other conversations that we've had, the other experts that we've had on the show, to help you, in fact, apply, learn, and find those gems that you need to build the premier accounting firm in your area. In addition to this, I also want to point out that we do have an annual event. It's GrowCon, and we're excited to have everyone come and attend this May again. It's for the owners of accounting firms. Find out more about GrowCon, as well as the other services that we provide here at Universal Accounting Center to help you build the premier accounting firm by going to universalaccountingschool.com. You can also give us a phone call if you'd like to speak with us directly, calling 801 265 377 And always remember this, if it is about accounting, it is universal. Take care, stay safe out there, and everyone have a great day.